Well, can you guys hear me? God is good. And all the time. Uh, I need to do that one more time just for myself. So God is good. And all the time. Thank you for that. I needed it. Um, have any of you had a week where it just felt every piece of news you heard was bad news? Everything was discouraging, brought frustration, and just, God, what, where are you in the midst of this? Um, sorry, real quick, I need to... My printer stopped working at the top it all off, so I have to resort to this technology, and I don't like it. Um, it's, it's too many things can go wrong when I'm relying on technology, but we'll give it a go here. Um, but that's just kind of the week uh, I've had, and, um, and so it's just been good uh, to be reminded that God is good all the time. You know, um, as I was saying... Uh, it just seemed like every day things seemed to get worse, and the news seemed to get more desperate, and um, and then so my heart was just heavy all week, and um, God in His goodness was able to um, shine through all of that. And and Friday, I'll just share with you guys some of the encouragement that I received from the Lord on Friday. So Friday. Uh, a student reached out to me. I'm the campus pastor at Tabor, by the way, if you didn't know that. So a student reached out to me, and they said, um, I'm really struggling um, emotionally, uh, mentally, and I just want to talk. And so we got together, and we talked, and, and we talked for a, a long time. Um, but it was so good because uh, she was just so hungry for the Lord. She'd never grown up in church. She'd never known um, what God can do and the freedom that he can offer. And so I was able to lead her to give her life to the Lord for the first time. So just to be able to, yeah, it was awesome. And so in the middle of this pit, I see this glimmer of hope, like, God, you are good. And back, if you remember, I don't know if you were here, some of you maybe were uh, back in July. I've spoken here more this last <laughs> month, it seems, than I have in the whole time my dad's been here, but um, my, my, uh, I spoke to you guys back in July, and uh, I talked about being the light of the world, right? And that's our theme this year at Tabor, is, is being a light, and it comes from Matthew 5, 14 through 16, so I'm g- going to read that real quick, and so I know we've been up and down a lot this morning, but if you don't mind, standing one more time, just for the reading of God's Word, honoring that. I'm going to read from Matthew 5, 14 through 16. And again, I know my dad uses a different version. I'm reading from the NIV. So here here it goes. Uh, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And that's the end of the reading of the word. You may be seated. Thank you, guys. So that's our, our theme for this year at Tabor is shine, right? And so as I've been going through this week, I've been asking myself this question, what does it look like to shine amidst tragedy? What does it look like to shine amidst heartache and not knowing what to do? Do I pretend like everything's fine? Do I really just bear it all and to let everyone know everything that I'm feeling? How do I act? How do I truly reflect God in the midst of of this suffering and and just times where nothing seems to be going my way. And it's a real thing. I'm being real. Like sometimes I'm not sure how to act. I'm not sure how to portray what I'm going through to others around me. When people say, hi, how you doing? Do I just say good even though I'm not? 
how do I act in the midst of despair and just so as I was thinking about this and um, just wrestling with God with all of this <clears throat> God took me to scripture so thankful for his word right it speaks to us wherever we're at the highs in life the lows in life so thank you Randy for what you're doing with giving out the word it is life it is the word of life and so God in his um, he took me to Job does anyone know the book of Job <laughs> I hope so if you don't you should it's dense Hebrew poetry, and so sometimes it's, you know, you have to kind of wade through it, try to figure out what's going on here. But if you can grasp what's going on, it's so powerful. And to truly grasp the book of Job, you really also have to understand the book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Proverbs, it, it says this, boiled down to a couple sentences here, that God is wise and just and he has ordered his world accordingly. That if you do good, good will come to you. But if you do bad, watch out. It's coming. Right? That's the book of Proverbs. And it's, it is showing wisdom is good. Wisdom, and it is. Even Ecclesiastes will tell you that. But Ecclesiastes comes along and says, well, hold on just a minute. I see all around me. Good people receiving bad and wicked people prospering. So what's going on here, God? What's going on? It's a little more complicated than it seems. And so we have this wrestling with the goodness of God. And we see at the end that the, the, the author of the book he, he's talking to the, the, the teacher, and then the author comes along and sums it all up. And just fear the Lord. That is the end of all things, he says. Fear the Lord and obey. But if we, if we look, understand those two things, then we can see where we're coming from in the book of Job. Sorry. I should have kept it on me. I didn't want a distraction, but I had an alarm going. Um, so it was bothering me. So I needed to just stop it real quick. Sorry about that. Um, the book of Job takes these two things and puts it into a story that really fleshes out this idea that sometimes bad things happen to good people. And how do we deal with that? And what does it mean? And so here we have uh, the book of Job. And it says in the very beginning that Job was a righteous and upright and blameless man. He was good. He did, he, did, he, did, he obeyed the law. He obeyed God. He was righteous, sinless, blameless, it says. And yet, through an interesting series of events, we have this kind of scene in heaven where God is kind of in his courtroom here, and in comes the Satan, the, the adversary, the accuser, who says, well, Job, of course he's going to love you and serve you. He's got all, you're blessing him. You're, you're like, you're doing all these things for him. But if you take all that away, we'll really see Job's true colors. We'll really see what he thinks and how he, he acts. And so, God allows this. Even though... Job had done nothing wrong to deserve this. And so he loses everything. His family, or at least his kids. His wife's still alive, and you'll hear in a minute why, how we know that. His kids, his wealth, his good name, everything, his health is taken from him. And he's left desperate. His wife tells him, just go ahead and curse God and die. His friends come along and they accuse him. They say, well, we know that God is wise and just. And he's ordered his world to be wise and full of justice. And so therefore, Job, you must have done something wrong because that's how the world works. So you must have done something wrong to deserve this. 
And then for 34 chapters, they accuse him of all of these sins that he must have done in order to deserve this punishment. And he, for 34 chapters, is defending his innocence. And we see him on this roller coaster of emotions, of at sometimes trusting God and other times questioning the goodness of God. And it's real. And we can relate to this at times. But in the end, Job demands that God come and defend himself, to, to answer him for himself. Why is this happening? This isn't the way of, of, of uh, justice. This isn't the way it's supposed to happen. And so he, he demands, God, come and, and answer, your, answer for yourself. And so God shows up in this storm cloud, and it's just, I mean, you can just picture in my mind, I just picture this, this huge thunderhead rolling in from the, west, from the east, right? Like, I grew up in western Kansas, and uh, there weren't any trees around there. Like, it, it might seem, some of you might think, if you come from other places, that this doesn't have a lot of trees. Well, just keep going west a while, and you'll really see the desolate, no tree area of Kansas. And so, I just picture this giant thunderhead rolling in from the west, and then God in his, is in the cloud, and he comes, and he shows up to defend himself. Well, to speak to Job. But, but rather than defending himself and telling Job why this has happened, he doesn't explain that to Job. What he does instead is he begins to lay out all the complexities of the world. All the complexities of, of creation. He starts in creation and goes through all of these things. And Job, were you there when I created or when I laid the foundations of the earth? In your wisdom, could you comprehend all of these things in the stars and on the earth and in the highest parts of the mountain and the lowest parts of the seas? Uh, can you comprehend this? He says, I created and I understand and I sustain it all. And Job realizes that he is too, his wisdom and his justice are far bigger and greater than he could understand. And in that moment, he's humble. He sees the magnificence of God and he's humbled. And what does he do? He confesses his error. Richard Foster in his book, The Celebration of Discipline, says, to see who the Lord is brings us to confession. When Isaiah caught sight of the glory of God, he cried, Woe is me, for I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When we see God for who he is, we're reminded of our place and how low we are. Seeing the Lord, although brings us low, it also leads us into worship. Seeing the Lord for who he is leads us into worship. Worship is our responding to the overtures of love from the heart of the Father, Foster says. Forms and rituals do not produce worship, nor does the formal disuse of forms and rituals. We can use all the right techniques and methods, and we can have the best possible liturgy, but we have not worshipped the Lord until His Spirit touches our spirit. In other words, when He reveals Himself to us, we worship. Singing and praying and praising all may lead to worship, but worship is more than any of them. Worship happens when God's Spirit reveals itself and touches ours. And we can see Him for who he is. Foster goes on to say that we worship the Lord not only because of who he is, but also because of what he's done. Above all, the God of the Bible is a God who acts. His goodness, faithfulness, justice, and mercy can be seen all through all his dealings with his people. His gracious actions are not only etched in ancient history, 
but they're engraved into our own personal histories. We praise God for who he is, and we thank him for what he's done. So let me bring this all back to the beginning. How do we live as a light in the world, reflecting God? How do we live as the people of God in the midst of tragedy and trauma and heartache? What I've come to understand is that we are to turn our eyes to him. One, and to remember the gospel. See, when we turn our eyes to him, we focus not on our circumstances, but on him. We remember and we, we see him high and lifted up, mighty and holy, majestic and beautiful, powerful beyond measure, omnipotent. He understands all the complexities of the world and he sustains it. He keeps it going and running. But when we remember the gospel, we remember what he's done. We remember the powerful, majestic, holy God came to earth because of his love and his goodness and his faithfulness and his grace. And we remember that because of his great love, he endured the cross. Setting his own desire aside to do the will of the Father. So as we remember these things, and we come to him in worship, it's amazing how we're filled then with hope and trust. So when we going through tragedy, what do we do? We turn our eyes to God. And we remember who he is and what he's done. And we're filled. And then we worship. Worship is part of that. I don't think we can see that and remember that without worshiping him. Without, how can we see who he is and, and remember what he's done without worshiping him and giving him praise? Like, I don't understand how we can do that. So that's part of it. But then when we worship, we're filled with hope and trust. So hope. When we turn our eyes to Jesus, we set aside our present circumstances and we remember who he is. We remember his goodness. We remember his power to heal. We remember the, his love for the hurting and the downcast and the outcast. We remember these things and we're filled with hope that he can do it again, that he can heal again, that his love is still for the hurting and the downcast and the outcast. We can remember this and it, and it draws us closer to him and it fills us with hope. When hope wells up within us, our faith is strengthened. We, we pray and intercede for others and our circumstances. We know he can do it and that he is good. I've seen examples of this all over the place. People reaching out to pray for us, for our family during this hard time. I mean, you can see an example of it in the football teams who gathered after the game to pray for Sean and Jenny. The concern from the community who rallies support and encourages, calls in to check on us, <clears throat> people of Jesus, we do this, whether we're conscious of it or not, because we have hope. We have hope. Hebrews 1.11 says, Now faith is confidence of what we hope for. Faith is confidence of what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. We can't know the outcome of the situation, but, but, because, we, it, but because we know who Jesus is and what he's done, we have hope that produces faith that God will answer our prayers. Even though we don't know the outcome, we have hope of who Jesus is. We have assurance of who Jesus is and we have hope and that produces faith in us that God will answer our prayers again. If Jesus has conquered sin and death and the grave, he is able to do all things. Romans 15, 4 says, For everything that was written in past was written to teach us. 
so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Psalm 62, 5 and 6 says, Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from Him. Truly, He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. When, in the midst of circumstances, we are able to turn our, a, our gaze from the immediate problem and we're able to look to the one in charge, we're filled with hope. Hope can overcome. And the second thing that happens is when we look to Jesus and remember the gospel is that we are filled with trust. When we turn to Jesus, we set aside our present circumstances and we remember who he is. We remember his power and his majesty and we see him on high and exalted and seated on his throne in charge and control of every aspect of creation all the time. We remember his goodness that was displayed on the cross and we remember that he promised he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And when we remember these things, we're filled with trust. Trust kind of just wells up. I didn't, this week I was going along and it wasn't until Thursday or Friday, but um, <coughs> finally I took my eyes off the situation and I was able to just gaze at Jesus and look to him. And, and it was amazing how even though the situation hadn't changed and we hadn't gotten any good news yet, like I just had trust that the Lord was in control and that I could trust him. Just as Job encountered God and had a new understanding of who he was, he now trusted that God was good. He understood that there were things outside of his understanding that God was orchestrating, but he knew that God was good. And when he encountered the Lord, he was confident of the character and the power of God in the face of any situation. What does it look like to place our trust in him? Well, it means not putting it in ourselves or in the things of the world. For starters, it means realizing our inabilities and shortcomings and flakiness and fickleness and realizing that he is faithful and just and good. It looks like Jesus, on the night that he was to die, agonizing in the garden, saying, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. It means releasing control and living open-handed with all that God has given. And it's not easy. But it's possible when we turn our eyes to him and remember all of his goodness. When we're able to do this, it's amazing. I don't understand it. It's supernatural. When we are able to do this, joy and peace follow. And we're filled with joy and peace. And the world takes notice of that. The world takes notice of joy and peace in the midst of tragedy and heartache. That's not normal. <laughs> That's actually very supernatural. But it, we grow up and we, we're in Christ and it's just so normal for us. But it's not. It's actually very crazy to actually have joy and peace when we, everything is out of control and nothing seems to be going right. Yet in the midst of this, to be able to say, wow, God, I trust you for who you are for what you've done in the past, I've seen you working, and I can trust that you are good no matter what the circumstances are, and I'm filled with joy and peace. See, oftentimes, it's easy to get caught up in the circumstances and the bad news and the desperation that we forget to look at the very source of life. We pray, but our eyes are down, fixed on the situation rather than up, looking at the one who has the ability to overcome. 
And so we're, we're often praying, but our faith is hindered because we're, we're not looking to the one. We're not looking at him and remembering his goodness. Remember what it said, hope. It is hope that, that builds our faith. And when we don't have hope, we're just, um, yeah, our, our prayers are, are, not that they're not heard, but they're just not as, um, as powerful as they could be. So, what do we do now? What do we do in the midst of heartache? I ask you, and I challenge you, whatever things you're going through, maybe not now, but you will, we all do, is to turn your eyes to the one who brings hope in the midst of despair, who brings joy in the midst of sorrow and peace in the middle of the storm. He will never leave you, for he's good and faithful, and he's able to overcome. And so together, I just, I want to end with all of us just focusing ourselves, our eyes, on Jesus. So you can just you can sit with your eyes open. You can close them if you want. But I just want to read the lyrics of one of, uh, one of my favorite songs. And then um, just to, to bring our attention and our thoughts and our focus on the one who can save. Okay, and so if you would, you can just close your eyes or you can keep them open, whatever you want to do. But here is the song, and it goes like this. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. Oh, but then on the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. O trampled death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night. And I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise, O Lord, O Lord, our God. Jesus, we turn to you. Whether we're in the middle of good times or bad, hard times or times of prosperity, Lord, we still need to turn our gaze to you for you are the one that brings life. You bring joy, you bring hope. You bring salvation. And so, Lord, we turn our gaze to you. Lord, if there are those here who are also going through tragedy and heartache, Lord, I pray that you would just comfort their souls. As they turn and they gaze at you, may they be able to worship you for your goodness. Worship you for who you are. High and exalted, mighty and lifted up. And yet you care for us. Your heart is for the downcast. And so we worship you, God. We thank you that you are with us, that you comfort us, that you bring us hope, you fill us with trust, you bring joy and peace, even when things are out of control. Why? Because you are good. And so, Lord, we just lift up up your name with praise. 
We thank you for your goodness. Pray that you would just bless each and every one as they go from here. May they experience you and see you in a new way that allows your spirit to touch theirs, that they might worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, if you want to stand for our closing hymn, number 506, I'd Rather Have Jesus. Yeah. Amen on that one. Go in peace. Let your light shine. Actually, I want to let you go with one verse. Okay. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.